And the race is on. Space Race, that is. Check out our interview with author Brad Bergen about his new book, Space Race 2.0, coming up next. Three, two, one. Welcome to Your Space Journey, where we venture into the future of space exploration. Your journey begins now. Hello, thanks so much for joining us today. Today, I'm pleased to introduce Brad Bergen, the author of the new book, Space Race 2.0. In this episode, we'll discuss this new book that follows the development of commercial space exploration to the present, including today's major players, SpaceX, Blue Origin, and Virgin Galactic. Joining me today is the book's author, Brad Bergen. Brad is a writer at NFT Now. Previously, he was a contributing editor at Futurism and senior editor at Interesting Engineering, specializing in space and tech. As an investigative journalist, his words have been cited in Bloomberg, Discover, and NBC News. Your Space Journey. Brad, thank you so much for joining me today. Hi, it's a pleasure to come here. Thanks for inviting me. Well, it is a pleasure. I tell you, I'm going to hold up your book now. Congrats on your new book, Space Race 2.0. is fantastic. I'm loving it. Um, what I think I really surprised me is it's not only a great documentation of what's going on now in space, but also has these incredible photographs that I was not expecting um, of spacecraft, the key players, facilities across the U.S. Uh, I was just wondering, can you give us a brief synopsis for your book for our audience? Yeah, of course. Uh, I think we had to sort of review the uh, sort of end or last bits of the first space race after the uh, Soviet Union fell and everything and the Cold War decided that. We had 135 space shuttle launches and the last one was in 2011 with Atlantis. And with that, it seemed a little bit like, where were we going next with the space race? And the first one, of course, as I said, was prompted by a sort of ideological uh, drive to outdo a sort of other space power of the Soviet Union. And since that ended, um, NASA was less and less able to, for, in my mind, financial reasons, it could be related to government or Congress, to um, sort of reach for new goalposts, not just the moon again, but beyond the moon. And that's when we started seeing private interests, as everyone is more familiar with now, private interested people like uh, Elon Musk, Jeff Bezos, and Richard Branson, with their right. private aerospace firms that were really dead set on developing technology from the ground up. And you have a few models behind you. The Falcon 1 up through 9 uh, were built almost entirely from scratch, which is something I learned in the process of this book, which is really exciting. The main difference between the uh, first and second space race, which is covered early in the book, is just that instead of only um, building and supplying <clears throat> excuse me, the spacecraft to go to space, private companies are also operating their own. Mm -hmm. So I thought now that we're at a threshold where NASA's Artemis is about to launch, fingers crossed, and then also uh, SpaceX's Starship is about to make its first uh, orbital flight, if all goes well, later this month, double, two fingers crossed. Um, I'd like to put a primer out there that kind of covers like how far we've come in this second space race where uh, public-private partnerships are helping humanity, at least symbolically, uh, reach uh, to the stars again in a way that we haven't before. That's my brief little synopsis. Um, Brian, I think that's a great synopsis too. I was wondering too, just, just why do you personally or globally, why do you think the space industry is important? I think sometimes I think he gets a little bit too idealistic in his speeches, but I think Elon Musk is right when he talks about the earth as a sort of nest or cradle for humanity mm -hmm. and that we have to move beyond that. Um, another kind of low tier reason to me would be just because it's there, like a mountain that we should climb because it's challenging. Yeah. But honestly, I think it's a, the highest, the high level reasons for me are a mix of a sort of symbolic drive to continue challenging ourselves and do something that's not just a repeat of something we've done before, like making more profit, doing more wars, going to space is really noble. But honestly, like uh, humanity having evolved for like so long and only come to a point where we've exhausted or practically exhausted the planet's ability to maintain the same ecosphere, um, social antagonisms are multiplying and if we don't basically find a way to rethink the way we do civilization we're going to stagnate and we're seeing signs of that almost with every headline today it seems like the space race or going to space is the most irrelevant uh, indulgence of industry and billionaires to a lot of people but to me admittedly a bit of a sci-fi geek since a kid and an amateur astronomer as a kid too um, i think that 
it might prove to be uh, one of the defining features of uh, the entire human race. I guess I'm going a little bit idealistic too, but there's so much to find out there. It almost sounds cliche to say, to say that there's so much to find out there and so much to do. No, I, I love that. And I, I think that comes across in your book too. It, you know, a little bit of that definitely comes across. And that's what I love about your book is it goes much deeper than rockets and key players. I mean, it has that <laughs> fantastic mm -hmm. uh, review of that, but you dive more into uh, deeper into why these companies like SpaceX and Blue Origin and Virgin Galactic, what is motivating them to pursue space? Um, why did you decide to take that approach? Well, I think um, <clears throat> with the first space race, presumably um, our ideological motivations as a, as a nation or a group mm -hmm. of allied NATO nations, et cetera, to go to space. Um, there were purely noble reasons, like uh, when uh, Apollo 11 left that, that little note on the moon saying that here mankind first stepped upon the moon, that was for the entire race, nobly. Uh, and since it's funded by NASA, presumably by um, you know, taxpayer money, it's our will, it's all humanity's will, it's the public. But when we have public-private partnerships, the one running the deal is the person at the top that owns the company. Yeah. Uh, we have less of a say in what our government chooses to subsidize, um, as we've seen with not just space industries, but other industries, a lot of them which a lot of people really don't like. Um, so I think it's, um, it behooves anyone interested in, in the second space race to find out if they uh, either want to support or just learn about what's happening right now what motivates these billionaires at the top uh, of these two companies that are doing it. And now, especially since it's been reduced um, last year, Jeff Bezos losing his lawsuit with NASA. Mm -hmm. In my mind, it's not that there's no chance for a comeback and SpaceX won't necessarily um, be the top dog forever. There are new people entering the scene, but um, with Musk at the head of everything, it's really important to understand why he wants to go to space and not just what he says about why he wants to go to space, but what he's doing. Uh, to make that goal happen. And I think that is why I wanted to talk about the motivations of these people and their upbringing, their background. See, and that's another thing I love in the very beginning of the book. I mean, you go into that where you, you go into detail on Elon Musk himself. And, and I, I kind of love how you trace just his family, how, how his parents, you know, influence him, especially his dad. Um, yeah. And then you talked about, you know, Richard Branson and of course, Jeff Bezos on that. Um, I, I thought I knew everything about the space parents. Um, I know, but you uncovered stuff that I just had not had no idea really. Um, if I can ask, just how did you become such a great investigative journalist? That's amazing. Oh, um, I might not have the most satisfying story on that. I uh, it goes back to just being a young kid uh, in my early twenties, just reading a lot. Um, I, I studied uh, before I even did my undergrad uh, in philosophy. I'd read pretty much the entire canon of Western philosophy from the ancients to about Derrida, and uh, then also picked up English degree. And by the time I moved to New York several years later, um, uh, a friend actually dared me to uh, see if I could publish somewhere that was a little bit more notable. And I found out that uh, I was actually kind of decent at it and ended up getting published at a Vice's motherboard vertical um, covering Juno's solar power. I think the header was something like uh, NASA's pushing solar power, but it can't get us past Jupiter. And uh, nice. I was just like, oh, lo and behold, I, all this like thinking and writing and, and being kind of reflective leads to some accidental skills. So how did I get to be an investigative journalist? I, it was kind of an accident, but I'm okay with that. Well, it's, it's worked out so well. Um, I love that. You love a good challenge. I, I do too. I think it's good. Someone puts you to the challenge, you're like, I'm going for it. Watch this. Um, so sit back and put your uh, belts on. Watch out. Um, during your research for this book, I, obviously a lot went into it. Was there anything that surprised you the most that you didn't expect? Hmm. <clears throat> Thinking about the bio and the background, I think maybe maybe two things is that I was I, I underestimated the extent to which Musk in interviews past had referenced uh, specific plot points of hard science fiction novels. Like Isaac Asimov novels, I didn't think he would actually be thinking about like, okay, the way I'm going to manage this and maybe society is to like minimize the chance of a dark age and like maximize the chance of some kind of like technological advancement. Um, because I've read that in a sci-fi book from the 60s or 50s or something. Um, I didn't expect to find that in there. On another side, I was surprised how difficult it was for me. Um, oh, this is kind of a two-layered thing. How difficult it was for me to find specific information on China's space race and their own like startup companies that they have their own 
public-private partnerships, which are state-owned, of course. Um, uh, and, and that's one side how hard it was for me, besides looking at like Harvard, um, you know, advanced or sorry, um, astronomers who just happen to know the right people. And also like the public's lack of knowledge about China's space program, besides the fact that like the rockets, you know, go wrong and end up crashing like in nearby neighborhoods or on islands, which I think is also in the book. Um, mm -hmm. Those are two surprising things to me about China, both like the how rapidly they're accelerating, whether or not in uh, NASA heads words, they, they're just really good at stealing stuff or just adapting really quickly. And the lack of uh, awareness uh, in the US and the West, of, like how quickly they're advancing. This isn't in the book because it's kind of a chapter one of Space Race 2.0, yeah. but you know, Tiangong, I think just launched the final module for their, or China just launched the final module for their Tiangong space station. And pretty soon, I mean, we don't have a set date for when ISS will be brought down, but it's very likely that uh, Tiangong could be the only operational space station in lower Earth orbit by the end of the decade, potentially. Wow, See, and that was actually kind of led to another question because uh, you were mentioning this, that wasn't the, the part wasn't in the book. And I was just thinking just from an, I guess, an editor point of view, so much, so much uh, effort went into this book. There's so many things and you gotta, you know, some things hit the chopping block, unfortunately. Was there, were there some things that didn't make it in the book? You're kind of like, oh, I hate to keep that out, but okay. I think if there's something I would love to have kept more in the book is the depth when it comes to engineering. I didn't have space for schematics of like the Falcon rockets or the schematics of the shuttle or schematics of New Shepard or of course not like schematics if anyone has them of China's rockets um, to go into how like thrust has evolved, the way that we build rockets has evolved, the way that we carry humans, the calculations, separation, you know, abort processes, how, you know, everything has changed so much since the shuttle. I think that's something that I look forward to working on in the future. It's a little bit more in depth about the engineering. Wow. You mentioned, also mentioned this at the beginning that uh, sort of an amateur astronomer, I'm, I'm definitely going to relate to you on that. I was going to say, what, what drew you to space? Uh, any, any particular story or any interest that drew you there? Well, I grew up in Iowa and in Iowa, there are cities, but uh, it's very easy to get away from the city and have a much deeper field of view on the universe. I don't think I, not since I was a really little kid, I think I remember seeing like the galaxy as a, you're supposed to be able to see it in a desert. Yeah. But uh, I also had a, a, a Celestron short scope telescope that my dad got me when I was a little kid. And I remember pointing it to see Mercury go retrograde in the late 90s uh, and looking at Jupiter one time. I remember um, this is before Shoemaker Levy 9. And I don't think I would have been able to see it anyway. But looking at Jupiter one week and then hearing that that was coming and looking at it another week and noticing those little dots around it weren't just dots, but there are moons sort of like evolving in your mind a sense of those those little white lights uh, in your in your eyepiece as a place and not just like stuff moving around it's kind of like this wild Copernican moment to have as a kid like you're the only one seeing this totally different place that's completely elsewhere than everything going on on earth and I thought that was really cool and that's probably how I got into space in the first place plus a lot of sci-fi I was definitely and still I'm kind of a huge nerd about a lot of classic 60s through, yep, exactly, 60s through not sci-fi. Awesome. All right, I gotta ask you this then. So, so being enthralled by the view of Jupiter and the moons, and I do, oh my gosh, that is amazing. The rings of Saturn is what really got me too. Um, would you go to space if you had a chance? Absolutely, I would go to space. No reservations? No, no, none at all. I mean, I would want time to plan, of course. <laughs> like there are a few things I'd have to get in order, but... Uh... I don't know if um if I got a call and I was like, hey, you wanna you wanna go for space on the DR Moon thing on a Starship with uh, Musk's ship and uh, the Japanese billionaire who owns a fashion industry or whatever? I'd probably say yeah, of course. Uh, I'll write you some short stories while I'm up there. That's cool. Oh, I would love to read those. That is so cool. Uh, I, I would do the same thing too. It's it's amazing. I mean, no hesitation, right? I'm go pack my little things, whatever I need to do. I'm good. Um, Space Race 2.0, just back to that real quick. Mm -hmm. uh, what do you hope um, your audience would, would gain from, from reading this book? There's a lot. Uh, this is very redundant for me to say, but there's a lot happening in the world. At every moment, we feel like we're in a new moment. It's different from all the other moments. Mm -hmm. And I think that, or rather, I hope that in the next few centuries, there might be a different way of 
living and being as a human being and space specifically. And right now as we're moving towards the thresholds of starshipping its first orbital flight and hopefully Artemis launching yeah. and humans on the moon again, we're right on a threshold. I think it'll be easy to forget the beginnings of this. And also I think it's important to have a sort of long form tactile means of engaging with the space race as a story, as opposed to endless headers and updates from like 10 to 50 budding verticals, trying to contain some market share covering launch news. And, you know, combined with everything else going on today with like uh, tensions with like Russia through Ukraine and China and then a supply shortage. Now we have a diesel shortage and everything. Um, yeah. It's still great to have some kind of hope. And I think this is a book that allows you to sort of sit back comfortably without having to get too technical and see that there is still a window to the future, even if you don't like all the means about it. I'm not a hardcore Musk fan. I don't buy into all of the hype, but even uh, even if you don't completely love the messenger, uh, the, the message is still there that we can, we can do better than this. You know, it is in space for 2.0 is available now. I want to encourage all of our audience to go out there. Uh, it's, it's online, Amazon, uh, Target, other retailers have it as well. Check that out. Uh, Brad, what's, what's next for you? What's coming up? Well, um, I think I am in the process of commissioning another book uh, that is very related. Uh, there's a little bit more depth to it. I think that's about as much as I can say about it, mm -hmm. but uh that should be coming in the next few years. I'm pretty excited about that. And if you like the images and the, um, the way everything is presented in this book, you're gonna love another one. Beyond that, um, I'm living in New York. Uh, I still time to time write essays and short stories. So if you're interested in stuff that's a little bit different than space, you can definitely find more things going forward. Um, if you don't mind my saying, my handle is filterthesnow at twitter.com. And uh, my website is bcbergen like the city only AN at the end. Excellent. And I'll be sure and put uh, links to those in our show notes. Brad, I want to thank you so much for taking time to join us. I really appreciate it. Hey, thanks for having me on. It was great to meet you. Your space journey. Well, I really enjoyed my interview with Brad today, and I'm really enjoying his book, Space Race 2.0. Again, if you can do me a small favor and like and share this episode with a friend, I'd certainly appreciate it. Thanks so much for joining me today. We'll see you next time. God bless.